giving you a voice, and making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archive first robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Good evening, fellow firsters, and welcome to this week's installment of your Mouth of the South Region Recap Show. Thank you all very much for spending some of your time with us this evening. We sincerely appreciate you continuing to tune in and joining us from all of your socially distanced locales. This week, we continue with our shallow dive format, where we spend time getting to better know some of the great teams in our region and discussing their organization, their season, robot, and whatever else you, faithful viewer, may have always wanted to ask them. This week, we head back down to Houston, Texas, and have the pleasure of talking to the team representing St. Agnes Academy and Straight Jesuit College Prep. With us this evening is Team 3847 Spectrum. So let's get right to it then. Reporting for first updates now, I'm Marco. And I'm Michael. All right, so let's start off by giving our guests the opportunity to introduce yourselves. Please tell us a little bit about who you are and what your primary role in the team is. Hi, I'm Alan. I'm the head coach for Spectrum. Uh, I'm Aiden. I'm the uh, Controls co-lead. Hello, I'm Emilio, and I'm also a Controls co-lead. Well, we thank you guys very much for coming on the show tonight. Uh, we really appreciate that. So the way this is going to work is we have a couple questions we'd like to ask you. Now, chat, this is directed to you guys. Uh, for this show to run smoothly, the more questions you guys ask us, the better. So please make sure you type any questions that you may have. We're going to be monitoring chat and asking them as we go. So, Marco. Go ahead and start us off. All right, excellent. So we'd like to start off by getting to know a little bit about how the team is structured and organized first and foremost. So can you guys talk about the general team roles and responsibilities, how those are split up and how it all kind of works together? Uh, yeah, so the team roles, are, it's more an organic uh, team composition. So uh, depending on how much time you put into the team and what you put your efforts into, that's naturally what it goes into. Uh, for example, I spent my time in the summer uh, learning how to code uh, for FRC, learning how to code drive trains, and then I became the controls co-lead for that. Uh, and, uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah, so, and our team is built a little bit differently than a lot of teams, because we have, uh, basically, I'm the only technical mentor, so it's normally me and about 25 to 30 students who do the entire robot. Um, so everything we end up dividing up into sub team leads where we have students who are in charge of each subsystem. Um, and I'm in charge mostly of project management and getting everyone working together and making sure the designs end up going in the right direction. Um, while we have student leads on every other part of the subsystem. How do you guys go about, uh, either nominating, picking, selecting, what have you, those student leads for your different subsystems? Uh, like I said, uh, the the roles, we don't really nominate anybody. It's more like how it organically flows. And I'd say generally we, we, we're all friends, so it's not like it's A versus B, but it's more like, oh, you've spent the most time on this, so you're probably the most qualified to do drivetrain. Or, oh, you've put in a lot of effort to uh, catting the shooter hood, so you should be the person that is in charge of that. Yeah, there's some there's some initial breakdowns um, right at the beginning of the season as we're looking through what the subsystem breakdowns are going to be. So we like this year we had to decide there was an intake, there was a shooter, there's a drivetrain, and we knew who has done things and has experience and how we kind of wanted to break people up into um, different subsystem leads. We also there's surveys throughout the year, kind of like who's willing to take on more responsibility, whose plans to be able to put in the time to do those types of things, um, and it kind of flows from there. We have several that'll be co-leads where it's not just like a specific person um, and it also isn't even as formal as oh this person's working on climber that means they're the only person working on climber if um, somebody happens to have more time and they need to go over and start working on it or something's not getting done somebody on the team will step up and do it now alan i know there's a lot of questions probably coming your way regarding open alliance but with you being the only technical mentor how do you keep all of your sub teams cranking out some fantastic documentation 
Uh, and I, I just want to know more, more about that process. Uh, Aiden, do you want to talk about the Tuesday design yeah. meetings? Yeah, sure. So every Tuesday we have a design meeting where the, the team puts together these uh, slide deck of everything that that group has done that week. So we'll have um, each subsystem will put together images and um, some phrases, and then they'll present it on Tuesday. Um, so everyone on the team kind of knows what's going on with each part of the robot, as well as so we can get that out for Open Alliance. Yeah, so those design reviews were really important this year. We've done them somewhat in the past, but they were never as formalized and they weren't as consistent as we were doing them this year. Um, and that helped a lot in making sure that we were really documenting as much as we could. Um, we also, in our Slack, they'll, uh, they'll send me stuff too if they're excited to show me, or if they're excited to get something up on the blog, they'll send stuff into Slack and then I can just copy and paste that into the blog really easily. Um, that's basically the last thing I do most nights is get the blog post out is my goal. That's your job. Got it. Okay, so uh, let's let's talk a little bit more about uh, the, the open open alliance. Uh, so your team is known for for doing the open uh, build for several seasons now. Frankly, actually, when I came down to Texas three years ago, uh, that was one of the first resources I saw. So can you talk to uh, talk to us about why your team decided to go in this direction in the first place? So actually, that's that's really interesting. That goes back all the way to when I joined Spectrum. So we started the build blog in 2012, my first year with Spectrum. Um, it was right after um, JVN had been doing his blog with 148 for a couple seasons. Um, and then um, Jim Zondag released an entire build blog postseason from 33 in 2011 as well. That's still available too. And both of those were really inspirational to me to try to, as I was trying to figure out how am I going to run this team? Because it was the first year I was in charge of a team was 2012. Um, and so part of that was, okay, we can do this thing and we can have this blog and that will... A lot of it was selfish reasons. Is I wanted to make sure I could have some way to communicate with parents and communicate with other team members who weren't going to be at every meeting um, because Spectrum is a little crazy. Right from the beginning, we've met every single day of build season. Build season used to be 45 days when there was a bag, and we met 45 days. Um, and I knew that none of the students were going to be able to meet 45 days straight. That's a lot, big time commitment. So I wanted to make sure even if you weren't at a meeting, you could be updated with what was going on. And doing it publicly just made more sense to me than trying to hide or show anything as I'm like, why do, why do I care if we, no one else is going to be able to just take what we do and do it magically better than us. We did all the development on it or everything, like the students do all the work. Mm -hmm. um, so if it can help people, why not do it, right? We didn't see any drawbacks to it even back then. And it's been one of the biggest things. Um, it's one of, been one of the best things for our team and just how much we get from it too. How many people contact us and give us ideas for ways we can improve or how much people just the, honestly, we'll get like gifts and things every once in a while. We're just like, wait, what? We didn't do anything. They're like, oh, we read your blog. I really like it. Here you go. And I'm like, okay, cool, I guess. Um, it's It's been really great for the team. Well, yeah. you answered a lot of uh, the, the questions that I just had, so that was pretty good. Um, go ahead, and I know one of you guys has something to say. Want to add on to that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that what can't be emphasized enough is that it's not like, – of course, we do it for other teams, but we also get a lot of ideas from other people's discussion. Um, specifically this year, um, we've been really trying to step up our vision stuff, and it, it's been very helpful to us to not try to keep everything secret and just have everything out so that people can look at it, try to copy it on their own, and then tell us what worked for them, what didn't work for them. Um, yeah, I, it's been very helpful for collaboration. Now. Adding on to that, uh, we, we now are entering, you know, the no bag seasons. So have, has that changed any of your processes or perspectives on the open build arrangement? Not, not really specifically on the open build season. Something that has changed uh, in the progression of our design, though, has been the how many projects we're taking on or how many things we're, uh, we're uh, prioritizing. So, for example... Last season, we left uh, the climb for later, but that was the only thing we left. But uh, this this year, we were more like, what's important for the first competition rather than like what's important for Worlds that we can worry about after our first competition when we have more time. I'd yeah, like you guys to kind of dive into into that a little bit more. Um, you, you, you're mentioning, you know, the initial team thoughts on the game. Talk talk me through that. What your strategy was and what your design and goal uh, goals were. Uh, so our one of our big design choices was going tall uh, rather than going short. And uh, the big reasons we chose this was that uh, we did it we've, we we on the first day we balanced the uh, 
pros and the cons to see what we choose, and we found lots of pros. Uh, with the higher release angle of the ball, you could score threes uh, more effectively. You'd have a better magic parabola where you could shoot into the threes from basically every point on the field. You could have a higher limelight. It'd be harder to block. And then you have more space inside the robot to fit things. And you have easier packaging along with that. But being short forces you to compact things and make the things small, as well as climb can be super simple. We just did a one-stage elevator up and down. And it was very reliable, simple, and fast. Do you guys have like a secret sauce that you guys use on that Saturday of kickoff on uh, how to how to get to this design or these design decisions? Um, I think that it's just like first thing we do, of course, is watch release, go over rules, and then a lot of it's just strategizing as a team. What based on point totals, what do we think is likely to give us the most points possible? Um, with just an efficiency, a t time efficiency um, on the field and off the field. Um, so yeah, I mean, of course, hanging, uh, we, we all agreed that that was very important. And then shooting, um, it was just, we, we saw the low goal and we saw the high goal. And I think that we saw that if we can just make that high goal, it's a lot easier than trying to put double the amount of balls in the, in the low goal. So a lot of it's just like team communication, like imagining how the game is going to work. Uh, we even like walk through it with human, uh, just humans pretending to be robots. How is this game going to flow? Um, and just a lot of theorizing how this game is going to work at the end. There was a lot of discussion on 2016 as well, but the last time we had a low obstacle in deciding whether you wanted to be taller or short. Um, and there just didn't seem to be that many advantage to us to be a short robot. Like the autonomous advantage was there a little bit, but we noticed pretty early that teams were going to be able to steal those back two balls from the other side before you could get it. So it, it wasn't really an advantage to be short for that. Um, and once you lose that, we thought we would be able to have the drivetrain to be able to get over and through the middle of the field without needing to use the trench. Um, so it didn't seem like it was worth all of the effort that we knew the packaging problems were going to entail. Um, by going short. We also thought that in the uh, uh, once you'd get into the rules in like elims, you'd see that only one robot can fit under the trench at one time, and so there'd be another role where you'd have to cross a, uh, the berms. So we thought that going across the berms anyway, why not just make it so that we can cross the berms very well every time and train our drivers to be able to do it all the time. Uh, yeah, great. Well, one of the... Uh things that came up in chat, and which is one of the questions that we had lined up for you guys as well, is I remember uh, being very surprised in 2018 when I learned that that, that Alamo Regional was the first tournament win for your team. You guys had <laughs> other blue banners, but that was the first time that you guys won that event. And since then, you've gone on to win three more events, including being the 2019 Roebling Division winner. So uh, my question is, what do you attribute the consistent performance on the field that your team has been able to achieve now for three straight seasons? So part of that was that we also had a couple really, really close calls in previous seasons. In 16 and 17, we had unbelievably close finalist performances. Um, so it's not like we just magically got good. <laughs> we definitely had been building up for a while. Um, but yeah, Emilio and Aiden, feel free to talk about the last couple of years. Yeah, uh, for me specifically, the alumni now have been uh, really helpful. Uh, no one's been mean or, or like... Uh, wanting to do everything, like, even for competition. Like, I remember it was the day before Texas State Champs, and we had uh, we were working on the suction climb part, and I was uh, I asked if I could countersink it, and it was, like, a time-critical part, and I was got able to do that. And even though I countersunk them the wrong way, uh, uh, it was still, like, a learning experience. <laughs> yeah, well, I think now, it's, it's, go ahead and finish it up before we... we move on to some robot questions. Aiden, go for it. Oh, okay. um, I think a lot of it's just like training all of our students. Um, I, th I think one thing we do really well as a team is making sure no one's afraid of like going out there and just trying an idea and seeing if it works or not. Um, I think that over the past several years, we've very successfully um, raised up all of our students to understand how the robots work, how the how the game's going to work, and then eat, like freshmen, sophomores junior seniors, everyone, whether they're on a certain um, subsystem or not, like being able to suggest ideas 
and it's just something we've built o- built up over the past four years. It's this culture of how can we suggest ideas uh, without being afraid to share or afraid to fail. Um, I, I think that's one of our biggest strengths is that we're not really afraid to fail, and that's how we iterate our robot. All right, well, now with the short amount of time that we have left, you guys have been answering, answering some great questions. Walk me through how the ball gets from the floor uh, into the goal. So it starts off on the intake. Uh, we have a two-roller intake and uh, with polycarp touching the ball. It's one Neo, and from there it goes into the powered V, which is uh, run by two Neo 550s. Uh, running at different speeds so that one, uh, if two balls go in at the same time, one will, uh, the right one will always go in first. And then we have the tower, uh, which has a pneumatic on it that moves the back roller back and forth to keep a ball either in contact or out of contact. So that's how we stop it from going into the shooter. And then once we're ready to shoot, it feeds into two accelerator wheels, uh, four inch and the two inch stealth wheels and then into two Colson sh- shooter wheels run by three Falcons. Can you walk me through how, uh, how you iterated this design? Um, what the material choices that you iterated through? Uh, some of those uh, type of things? Yeah, for the intakes specifically, uh, we iterated first from three rollers down to two rollers. Uh, and actually, the way we did that is we went from three rollers to uh, pool noodles because we had, oh, what's the a light thing we can use instead of polycarb tube because polycarb was a bit heavy for three rollers. And then we said the pool noodles increase the diameter without actually like um, increasing weight by much. In fact, it decreased the weight. And then we went from two rollers with uh, pool noodles to two rollers with polycarb and we saw that that actually decreased us a lot of weight and it was just as effective as just doing three rollers. And I guess my last question before I uh, hand things over to Marco would be uh, talk about your climb. And also, I kind of am curious about your buddy climb uh, that you guys were working on, at least in some of your documentation. Um, I can talk about the climb. So the the climb is really, really simple. It's basically just similar elevator. Um, sort of to last year, we ended up moving the made all of the bearing stationary on it um, for some packaging reasons. Um, but it's just a single elevator chain up both sides, up latches onto the bar. Um, we actually used um, mechanical advantages latches this year to latch onto the bar for us, um, part another Open Alliance member. Um, and then we did have a buddy climb system that we were working on. That was a large part. That was part of the reason why we wanted to go tall too, was to be able to do a buddy climb. Um, but we ended up realizing just how much time it was going to take and how hard it was going to be to get other teams drivers to actually align to the forks after seeing a couple other teams who attempted a buddy climb um we decided to scrap it and not pursue it going forward um but yeah it was just going to be two forks that deployed down out of the um bottom of the robot awesome well um i wanted to switch gears real quick a couple last questions before we let you guys go um tri is one of the longest running texas off seasons and really one of the most well-run off seasons around there's always great competition and cool stuff that happens uh, during the event thanks to you guys um, I remember 2018, you guys did all the lights out matches during that practice day, which is one of the most fun things I've ever done. Um, after the cancellation of the season, I got to imagine you guys were inundated with applications. 2020 version of TRI was originally scheduled or is originally scheduled to begin on July 9th. Can you talk about the current status of that event? And are there any thoughts about pushing the event back if circumstances dictate? Sure. So, yeah. So our plan right now is to hold TRI at the earliest possible date that we're allowed to, but not earlier than the July 9th, right? So um, please apply. There's no re- the applications have been open for, since January or earlier. I think they were open in like October, or November. Um, so please apply if, you have, if teams have any interest in coming. Um, TRI app dot spectrum dot org, um, and we'll, our plan is to hold it as soon as our schools allow us to in some way, whether that's in July or in October, November. But we'll let teams know as soon as we're able to. Well, excellent. So the plan is it will go on just TBD date. You that know, is the possible. goal. Excellent. Um, and then finally, obviously, it's been a tough season for many. Um, we've dealt with a, a lot of loss, lots of competitions, opportunities to excel and to learn. And also, we saw the first season since we lost Dr. Woody Flowers. So obviously, Alan, you were the 2019 Woody Flowers Award winner from the Houston Champs. Um, I think first alumnus to receive the award. You've had a year now to reflect on that honor. And with everything that's happened since then, 
Uh, I was curious what that awards means for you now. And what do you see your role or responsibilities and are they any different than what they were before? Uh, thank you, Marco. Um, yeah, it's it's been a very interesting year. Um, thank you to the community for congratulating me and telling me how much I deserve it. I still kind of amazed that I that I want it. It still almost hasn't really sunk in. Um, but it's been a really, really cool experience to get to be involved with a group of Woody Flower Award winners. Um, it's a really close knit group um, that we get to um, talk about some of the issues going on with first and things and just being part of that community has been a really um, enjoyable experience. Um, but then also having to deal with the loss of Woody has been was very emotional. It was good to have their support there as well. Um, and being able to go to the memorial and things. Um, but I do want to make sure that teams do understand that one of the best ways to honor Woody is to nominate more mentors for the Woody Flowers Finalist Award and for the Woody Flowers Award. Um, so as many teams as can, as many students, it's such a great way to show your mentors that you appreciate them. Um, even if they don't, even if you don't think they have any shot of winning or anything like that, writing out the essay, submitting it, reading it to them at your team banquet or giving them a nice framed copy of it or something is such a great way to honor your mentors um, and give a little bit back to them for the time that they've given to help improve your lives. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think with that, that's going to do it for us today. Aiden, Emilio, Alan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us this evening and letting us uh, get to know you a little bit better. We're thankful for you taking the time to chat and look forward to hopefully seeing you guys in person and on the field, hopefully strikes um, somewhere in the not too distant future. Um, that's going to do it for this evening. Remember, our show will be dark next week. Tune in to see some more shallow dives with teams from across the country. Um, as always, Fund needs your help to stay loud, live, and independent. Please consider giving your support by joining Fund Nation with a subscription or bits on Twitch, becoming a Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now, or just letting people in first know that this is a place to be to get the information they need. Don't forget to check us out on any social medias of your individual preference. On behalf of myself, Michael, and our producer, Tyler, I would like to thank you for tuning in. Thank you to all the moderators in chat. If you're watching us live, then up next for your viewing pleasure is Best of the West. Thank you all. Good night. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.